Chair, it's now 7 p.m. Are we good to start the meeting? Good evening. I'd like to call um, the meeting to order for the regular meeting of the Parks and Recreation Commission for August 27th. Um, we will begin with a, a roll call. Chair Brown? Here. Vice Chair Freeman? Here. Commissioner Cribbs? Here. Commissioner Greenfield? Commissioner Kleinhaus? Yes. Commissioner Way? And Council Member Binker? Here. Chair, that is four commissioners present. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next item on the agenda is public comment. So for members of the public wishing to address the commission on matters within the jurisdiction of the city, but not on this agenda. So if it's not related to the park improvement ordinance or the first T update, uh, now is the time to raise your hand and provide comments for up to three minutes. Uh, if you're on Zoom, please raise your hand. And if you're in council, please fill out a speaker card and hand it to staff. Chair, I'm seeing no hands raised online or in person. Great. All right, we will move on um, to agenda changes, additions, and deletions. Are there any um, proposed changes from the commission? Okay, moving on. We'll move on to the minutes from the July meeting. If there's any comments? Nothing? I don't know what? Okay. All right, do we have a motion? It is okay. We have a motion for approval of the July minutes. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Great. So let's have a roll call vote. Chair Brown? Yes. Vice Chair Freeman? Yes. Commissioner Cripps? Yes. Commissioner Kleinhaus? Yes. Chair, that's a 4 0 vote. Thank you. And moving on to the department report, I'll hand it over to Steve. Great, thank you uh, for having us today. So um, Sarah, why don't we kick it off? All right, good evening, Commissioner Sarah Robastelli, Division Manager. Um, next slide. So uh, we wanted to kind of recap some of the summer special events that have taken place. Um, the Municipal Service Center had a, an open house, which was a huge success. There was over 1,200 attendees, which is 500 higher than last year. And it just was a great time to showcase the operations outside of the um, MSC. Um, this month, we rounded out uh, our Twilight Concert Series, um, which the last several took place at Rinconada Park, and there was a roughly uh, 700 attendees. That's that photo on the right there. And this summer, there was also six movie nights um, that were family movie nights that wrapped up this month. Next slide. So upcoming special events, we have the next month is the uh, 40th annual Moonlight Run Walk. And this event will be held on Friday, September 20th. There's a half marathon, 10K, 5K uh, run and walk. Um, for more information, you can find that out online, which is listed on the slide. And then um, come jaunt through our Jack-O-Lantern um, special display Friday, October 25th from 6.30 to 8.30 at Lytton Plaza. Be sure and cast your vote um, because there, we will be honoring the scariest, the cutest, and most creative. The winner of each categories are picked by um, those who visit. And um, there's also a prize of $75 um, to a local Palo Alto business. Next slide. So um, this, this slide's highlighting some of our special interest classes. Um, the recreation offered 35 of them this summer and four um, kind of after, after camp care um, camps, which allowed for 656 campers to experience being chefs, mini, um, create many cities with Legos and 
offer um, confidence with public speaking and so much more. Um, the summer uh, of of this year's revenues exceeded the uh, last year's with an increase of 15%. Um, and this here is we're highlighting is um, our mayor, uh, young mayors build at Green Lego Utopia. It's been a yearly tradition for the mayor to make a one day visit in um, one of our camps and Mayor Stone did that this year, which gave all the campers a fun opportunity to share their uh, Lego cities as they built and show off their master plan for a green community. Um, and I, next slide and Steve will take it from here. Great, thank you, Sarah. All right, so we have a few project updates. Uh, I just first of all like to thank the uh, Park and Rec Commission for their uh, and the public basically for hearing the PAUSD request uh, on our last meeting uh, for the pickleball lines of Fletcher Middle School, uh, Terman Park, uh, and providing their valuable input for that. Uh, they assisted us in basically making a decision to move forward with the PAUSD request and uh, striping the blacktop in Terman uh, Park for pickleball use. Uh, staff along those lines took the recommendations and we tested out uh, different pickleballs uh, and they had approved about five different types that were uh, had about the same decibel readings, which came out to about 70, uh, which if you're taking a look at it is light traffic or a vacuum cleaner and normal uh, vocalization to what I'm doing right now is about 60 decibels. So they really weren't that bad. Um, and the librarian ball, we did try that one out, which was previously discussed as the quiet type of ball that was over there. Um, but we did find issues with that one when we tried it out on that surface. Basically, it had a different bounce of the court and um, the abrasiveness of the court that we had over there, uh, it didn't hold up at all. It was too abrasive and it basically tore the, tore the ball apart. So we did give that a try as well. Um, and then basically uh, staff will provide court closure notifications uh, once we determine when the uh, work date is gonna be confirmed and we'll post that for notification as well. So more to come on that. And then on the photo on the right-hand side here on the slide, uh, this is basically the Foothills Nature Preserve Conference Room. Uh, staff has gone through and updated this one. Uh, we can see we have basically new carpeting and new desks in there uh, and new tables for that for uh, the public to use on that. Uh, also, uh, of notification, basically, we had the city of Palo Alto partnered with the Santa Clara, Santa Clara County uh, Fire Safe Council on the annual evacuation route mowing uh, of Astrodero and Page Mill Roads. That was uh, completed in about three weeks. Uh, today, actually, I just got the notification that they finished out the project, so it went as planned. Um, we had a lot of uh, help from basically collaboration from uh, the fire department, from our public works and our communications division in uh, addition with um, the, uh, the fire safe council. So, but everything went as planned and it worked out well. Next slide. All right, golf course irrigation and stormwater pump. Uh, what you're seeing here on the left-hand side is an irrigation uh, pump uh, station repairs were completed. Uh, last week, and including a, uh, a sustainable pump, a breaker switch, uh, which really is important to keep the pressurized system on that. Uh, so that took some time to get done. And then we also had staff install new check valves basically to keep uh, our water operations working correctly. And the picture you're seeing on the right there is a storm drain pump, uh, which are station floats. Uh, they're brand new. They were replaced last week in anticipation of the upcoming uh, rainy season. Wanted to get that work done prior to having to, you know, get those on full swing. Next slide. All right, Ramos uh, Park restrooms. Uh, it's in the final stages of completion. That's uh, the one on the left-hand side there and uh, scheduled to open by mid-September. So we're looking forward to that. And then on the right-hand side, the Rinconada restrooms, uh, they were opened up yesterday morning. So those are fully open up for the public for use. So really happy to see that project, uh, you know, going to its finality. Next slide. Bulwer Park uh, took a ride out there last week and took a look at it. Uh, the majority of the concrete work is now complete with the current focus on the final grading at the site. Um, this is a very large project. It's been going on for some time. And uh, the contractor will start the installation of the playground footings um, next week. 
and at Cameron Park on your right-hand side, which you're seeing in the picture there. Um, in order to uh, make the park uh, more inviting and accessible to the users, uh, they had a huge row of overgrown junipers uh, that was on each end of the access points to that park. And to basically give it better accessibility to that, we had those removed. It just adds a whole different feel to the park as you're actually walking up to it and uh, coming into it. It really just opens everything up. And then we're going to work basically with our um, public works department uh, to basically to get the uh, bollards put back in there um, for traffic safety as well. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the subsurface compaction testing has been done and targeting a September completion for that project. And with that, that's the end of our report. Thank you very much. Do we have questions from the commission? Yes, thank you. I just have a question about the Ramos Park restroom. Um, I go by there on my way to different places and there's still a lot of yellow tape around and tractors and that kind of thing. It's going to be finished mid-September and the planting will be done around the area as well? That's the anticipated plan, yes. If, we, if it's not done when we open it, we'll mm -hmm. do it very soon afterwards. I see. Okay. But there is going to be planting done for, well, those, for that area. It looks great. Thank yes. you very You're much. Welcome. Commissioner Kleinhaus? Still about the Ramos Park um, bathroom. Did you find out why they were oriented? It shouldn't work. Did oh. you find out why they're oriented towards the picnic tables and not towards the playing fields like initially people asked for in the public meetings? Um, and here? Yes, on that one, um, there was no definitive answer on that yet, but I'm still uh, seeking that answer for you. Okay. So I'll bring that back at the next meeting for you. I'm just curious if there's a reason or it just, because, you know, I think people can, uh, pick it doing like they had a picnic there, right? In the fencing and the orange tapes and all that, but the bathroom really faces right at the picnic table. So it's a little <laughs> weird. Um, uh, another comment is the nature corner. We, I, we, I've been asking you to provide something of our ecosystem on our, in our meetings. So I was hoping that you'll actually provide something about an animal, a plant, something that is going on nature uh, oriented. And in that context, I understand uh, removing junipers to make the park more accessible, but that is a loss of habitat. Is there any improvement elsewhere for or planting something to compensate for that? Absolutely. We're going to be doing an entire replanting of uh, two of the uh, existing walls over there adjacent to the playground area. So we're doing a complete redo of all that habitat. Yes. So are you using native plants for yes, that locally? Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the uh, uh, in-depth presentation. Um, the feedback on the um, uh, Chairman Fletcher, uh, is that, that's, uh, maybe I missed it, but you, you indicated that those lines have already been painted. Is that correct? They're not painted yet, but we have, we're going to, we are going to uh, proceed with the painting of those. Yes. Okay. What, what's the timeline on that? And um, do you, is there any impact, I guess, to because school's in now, so I'm just wondering if there's any impact when you actually start start that operation. We're not anticipating any impact with that. It will coordinate that with the, uh, uh, basically, as this was a request by PAUSD, we'll coordinate with them, with the principal over there, and make sure that doesn't impact you know, any of the activities with the school. Okay. And then what's, once, once the, uh, the painting is done, and then it will be available for the school and, I guess, the public to actually start using it, will there be any sort of... Um, announcements um, to let people know kind of what that schedule is and um, just especially in the neighborhood, I guess, but also the availability of when, well, the park, well, when at, it actually becomes available. At this time, it's intended basically for the PAUSD students and um, after school programming for students. Okay. All right. And um, regarding uh, Ramos Park, that's done. So that's a good job. On, on Rinconada, is there the, I know that's a work in progress. When is, when is that scheduled? 
rink up. The, so flip flopped. Rank oh. Nada's completed. Um, Ramos is going to be online mid September. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all the wonderful pictures. And I know it's hard to see progress uh, when you're looking at the parks day after day, but seeing it month after month, um, reporting on the progress being made, it does make it look like things are happening uh, very quickly. Um, cool about testing out the balls. I think that's very much appreciated going above and beyond just to make sure that we do our research. And I agree with the 70 decibels that seems right in line with the noise ordinances that are permitted in residential areas. And because it is the residential surrounded by schools, I think that sounded spot on. Um, and yeah, I'm just uh, interested to see um, more, um, more progress. And uh, for the fire safe mowing, that was a project that was funded by a fire safe county. It wasn't the, the city's funding. It was their specific project i believe that was city funding yes oh, okay All yes. Right. Great. it was a collaboration awesome. between the three different departments Love that great any questions council member Winker? all right um okay. all right we will move on to the first business item which is the park improvement ordinance for valley waters palo alto flood space and tide gate structure project great thank you very much with that i'd like to uh for our next presentation presentation from valley water I'd like to uh, introduce Carl Newman. Good evening, Chair Brown and members of the commission. Carl Newman, uh, good to see you again. Um, here with me today are some of my colleagues. Um, uh, Bhavani Yeraputu, she's our Deputy Operating Officer from the, um, the Watersheds Capital Division. And then also with me is Ted Ibarra, who is my new uh, Product Manager, Associate Engineer uh, in our division. Um, so today I'm here to talk about the Palo Alto Flood Basin Tide Gate Structure Project. Um, this um, portion of the work focuses on a seismic retrofit and rehabilitation of the project. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so we're here today to um, give an update. We were last here on June 25th to provide um, a, a, a little bit longer presentation. Today it's a little bit shorter. Um, and, and to give another presentation to this commission. And then ultimately we'd like to seek uh, the commission's recommendation to move this to the city council um, to approve this park or, uh, improvement ordinance. Next slide. <clears throat> um, so some background on the existing tight gate structure. Um, as you may know, it's just built in 1957. Um, and this um, flood basin provides um, flood protection for three main creeks that flow into the basin. Uh, that includes Matadero, Barron, and Adobe Creeks. Um, there is one gate that is operated by the city of Palo Alto. It's, on the, it's actually on the far left side. There's, there's eight gates total, so it's, it's the one on the far left. Um, and, and the city's been operating this, operating this uh, gate for many years. Um, the tide gate also um, provides a bridge um, along both sides of the levee um, that is part of the um, San Francisco Bay Trail. Uh, the function of this gate is to hold out um, tide, high tide water um, uh, into the basin, and then also when the tide is low, um, it allows water to, to drain out of the basin into the bay. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Here is a, um, a project map of the of the tide gate. The the big red circle in the upper um, portion is is where the tide gate structure is located, um, uh, next to the San Francisco Bay. Um, the flood basin is is located um, in that sort of greenish color um, shape um, within Bixby Park. Um, in the, um, the 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 southern part of the um, slide, you can see the three creeks that are that are flowing into. Um, into the basin um, that passed beneath Highway 101. Um, <clears throat> and there's, there's also a, a Coast Casey pump station that, that also pumps water into the basin um, um, from over by Shoreline Lake. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, as, as I mentioned, this is uh, uh, the main uh, purpose of the project is to do a, a seismic um, retrofit and also do a rehabilitation of the, of the uh, structure. Um, the existing structure, um, because it was built in 1957, um, 
uh, that predated a lot of the seismic codes that we have today. Um, it, it, re it is really outdated, and so we're going to bring it up to seismic code. Um, we anticipate that a large earthquake um, could damage it. Um, it. It could move, and and that would cause some some displacement or, or settlement um, moving downwards or, or sideways that could cause the, the flap gates to not operate properly, um, to open or close properly. And obviously, if, if those weren't able to open or close properly, um, that would affect the way that the, the tides, um, uh, tidal water flows into the basin um, or uh, the way that the water flows out of the basin into the, into the bay, and so, um, which is the main function. Um, and that protects um, the basin from coastal flooding and then also flooding um, of the basin itself from, from the rivers that, that flow in there. Mm -hmm. um, and also um, protects it with the habitat that are, that are within the flood basin. And so um, <clears throat> any significant structural damage that was done to the tide gate as a result of an earthquake would require us to, to close uh, that, that structure and as well um, the, the trail that uh, is, is used on top of it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, project objectives is um, currently, um, be because the, the future work is uh, predicated on the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at a future date um, when, when they're going to be doing the, the shoreline work. Um, right now, we want to extend the, the, the design life and the service life of the structure. And, and the, the best way that we know how to do that is to, to do a seismic retrofit. And um, we want to get an additional 30 to 40 years of, of, of life out of it. Um, currently, the Army Corps estimates to be doing the, um, the shoreline levy work around 2060. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, the project benefits are continued uh, flood protection from coastal and riverine, um, continued use of the Adobe Creek Trail, um, uh, improved tide gate structure, the deck surface mainly, um, it'll be it'll it'll be higher quality and, and better safety. Um, we're putting in some safety measures, which I'll show in, in a little bit. Um, but we're we're also putting in some some features for our own maintenance, um, and that'll reduce any trail closure time when we do that maintenance. Next slide, please. This is um, a three D um, um, rendition of of um, the work that we're gonna be doing. Um, one of the elements that I mentioned, the safety elements is we're gonna be um, um, raising the height of the existing um, fence out there. Um, that, the color of the fence is right now, it's like a, more of a natural beige. It can be colored anything that, um, that the commission chooses or, or the city of Pelton chooses. I understand there might be a preference for color. So um, that's just a vinyl coated um, uh, on the fence so that can be colored in any, any way. Um, also, we're going to be doing a polyester polymer concrete deck surface, um, and that's one of the main um, rehabilitation elements of the work. Um, basically, we, we're going to grind off the old concrete deck and then um, uh, put in this uh, polyester polymer concrete overlay, um, and that we, we think that'll give us um, that, that 20 to 30 years of design life uh, for the surface, and that can be roughened um, to make it safe for pedestrians. Um, so there are a variety of finishes that we could do on there. Um, as I mentioned, the maintenance access, we're going to be um, adding in um, a, a way for our maintenance crews to get into the trash racks a little bit easier. Um, we're also going to be putting gates within the fence, and that'll allow uh, better access to the gates. Um, our maintenance crews need to go in there, typically before the rainy season, to make sure those are working properly, they're sealed properly, and are, and are functioning the way they should be. Um, and then the retrofit element, we're going to be um, installing some deep foundation system on both sides of the existing structure. Um, and it's basically these two large cylindrical concrete piles that go deep into the ground. Um, next slide, please. And this is, um, this is a 3D version just to kind of show you what that deep foundation is going to look like. Um, it's two large cylindrical piles that are going to go deep into the ground. And then it's connected with a, with a concrete structure at the very top. And then that's going to be connected to the existing structure with, with large pieces of rebar that are kind of doweled in. And um, as you can see, it's, it's within the levee system. So it's, it'll, be, it'll be covered up and it, you won't even be able to see it um, once it's completed. 
Uh, next slide, please. So this is our, our schedule. Um, we've, at this time, we've completed the, the actual um, CEQA addendum document. Um, the next step is to take it to our, our, our board of directors to have it considered um, at the October 8th meeting. Um, that, is, that is a tentative date, but that's what we're planning at this point. Um, we are planning to, to go to, to the public to provide them an update on our design, um, and that's gonna be November 20th. Um, and then this fall, we're gonna be completing our design documents, and at that time, we'll also obtain our environmental permits. Um, and then in the spring, we plan to, um, we call advertise or, or go out to um, potential contractors and um, where they bid on the project. Um, and then we um, will go with the lowest qualified bidder to award the contract. And that's another board, uh, board action. Um, and then by early summer, we'll be issuing notice to proceed to the contractor. And then, and then actual boots on the ground, construction work will, will, will begin in September of 2025. Um, that those dates coincide with the, um, the, um, the nesting season for the Ridgeway rail that are in the area. And so that's when the Ridgeway rail are, are, are not gonna be met nesting. So that's why we're um, doing construction work during that time. Next slide, please. Here you can see our, our trail closure plan. Um, we're gonna be closing about a little bit less than a mile of, of the trail. We're trying to minimize as much as possible to where we have our staging areas um, on, on both sides of the, of, of the, of the, the tide gate. Um, and this will just be between September of 2025 and January of 2026. This is kind of an extreme window, but we just, we just wanna say that there's a possibility of that. If obviously the work is done earlier than that, then this, the trail closure would be much shorter. Um, our work hours are between uh, Monday to Friday, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. This is assuming that we um, um, have, have approval for our noise accession permit. Um, in the event that um, work is, is, is a little bit behind, possibly due to um, rainy weather, because we are going to be working in, in the rainy season, we may need to work on Saturdays to catch up, but that's only as necessary. Um, there will be occasional construction traffic. Um, during the work hours, um, and that's to bring in materials, uh, new equipment, that kind of thing. Um, flaggers will be present um, when they're coming off the public streets or going onto the public streets. This is the construction equipment um, to make sure that it's done safely and isn't, um, isn't uh, a problem with the traffic. And then uh, throughout construction, we will be providing a public outreach in the form of we're putting out, um, actually our construction sign will have a QR code. And on that QR code, uh, anybody can go onto our website and look at the, um, the updates and, and how to contact us, who to contact in case you have questions or any comments. And then um, we'll, also, um, we'll also be going out to the public right before construction to let them know of anticipated construction impacts, our schedule, and again, just try to re relay this information to them and answer any questions they have and any concerns they may have. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our environmental document is a mitigated neg negative declaration. This is for when we were um, previously when we were looking at the um, replacement project. Um, it was a final MND that was adopted in April 27th of 2021, and it, it is available on our project website. Um, since the scope has been reduced to to a ret retrofit and rehabilitation project, we've done an addendum to the MND, and that was just prepared this month. Um, and as I mentioned, we're taking that to our board um, October 8th. Um, the permits that we have for this project are um, going to be coming from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, the State Water Board, and then the San Francisco Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so our project website is um, at valleywater.org, Palo Alto Flood Basin Tide Gates. Um, as I mentioned, Ted Ibarra is our project manager, and this is his email, and then our um, the public uh, neighborhood liaison is uh, Gianna Escobar, and that's her contact information. Um, next slide, please. And I wanna thank you for allowing us to make this presentation and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I was gonna say, before we go to the 
public, just because it's a very technical presentation, I'm going to allow clarifying questions from the commission on the presentations, and then we'll go to public comment right after that. So if there are any clarifying questions from the commission, not comments or opinions at this time. Commissioner Kleinhaus. There were questions that came that were here last time that I didn't hear answers to. So I'm not sure when that needs to come. We can talk, we can go do that after public comment, but if there's any specific clarifying questions on the technical components, no. Okay, um, if you have a comment on the public comment on this item, please raise your hand on Zoom. There's no hands raised online or in person, Chair. All right, thank you. So bringing it back to the board, uh, now we can discuss comments and specific items relevant to the project. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Commissioner Kleinhaus, you right. Thank you. Um, this is a bridge between two levees, right? And so one of the questions I asked, and I would like to hear an answer to, is what level of earthquakes will this, the current bridge may sustain, the new construction will sustain, and how that relates to the levees. Because if, if the structure stands, but the levees are gone, like how does um, liquefaction of the levees play into the um, studies that you've done and is public, and I think that kind of relates to one of the questions that uh, one of their commissioner asked last time, which was how did our public work, uh, the city public works, look at that and look at the design and the um, how they would withstand the different levels of potential earthquake magnitudes. Uh, yes, um, so. With regard to the level of earthquake that this um, retrofit was designed for, it's designed for a magnitude 7.0 on the richer scale. Um, our um, geotechnical consultant has identified liquefiable soils um, beneath the levee structure and, and nearby the, uh, the tide gate structure. Um, the Palo Foundation that I showed you, um, the deep foundation that is the main size of retrofit um, element has been um, designed to accommodate that the liquefaction in those soils. Basically, liquefaction happens in sandy soils when it's subjected to the earthquake loads. It 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 tends to um, reduce the um, the strength of the soils. Um, and so, another effect that could happen from that is that is that you can get settlement. Of, of the land surface above the liquefiable soils. We do anticipate that there could be some settlement. Um, we, don't, we don't think that there's gonna be any major failure, but there could be some settlement which will result in some cracking of the levee surface itself. Um, and so that would, would, if that were to happen, that would require some repair. So is it possible that in a major earthquake, the new structure stands because it's been retrofitted, but the levees, all the levees around it are gone? No, they wouldn't be gone. They would just, you, you would, you would, you might see them, the actual levee surface um, subside a little bit and you might see some, some cracking um, between the, between the, the adjacent levee. Um, but that can be that can be repaired. Um, but it, we don't we don't think it's going to fail. Talking about the actual levees of the flood basin, not right at the structure. That's yeah. That's what I'm talking yeah? about. The okay. actual levees. Yep. Thank you. Um, my second question is also in relation to the levees versus the actual structure and the bridge. You're proposing to change the surface of the existing bridge. And from last time, if I that I was here when you discussed this, which is quite a while ago, um, I think you discussed that this would make it a better surface for the bike to ride on. But both sides, and so using some kind of concrete epoxy um, to, to, to create a, a better surface. But both sides of this are just levees with 
gravel roads on them. They're not the best surfaces. So why would you want to change surface on this bridge where the two sides of it already have a very rough surface? And when I walked there, the, actual, the bridge now didn't look any worse than both sides of it. And also a lot of the um, unevenness right now is because little pieces of gravel come from the sides because people take them with their wheels or their shoes. So I'm not sure that we need to do that. And I'm trying to understand why you would create, you know, a perfect surface between two completely unperfect surfaces. Um, so it, the, the existing surface um, does have a lot of concrete um, fractures and, and, and spalls um, is what we call them really. Um, and, and that's a result of the, um, the, the, the salt in the air that's basically corroding. Um, it, it, it weakens the concrete and it can also weaken the, the, the reinforcement that's within the concrete. And so this overlay, um, what it would do is it would give it a, a, a fresh uh, new surface, provide that level of protection for the, the reinforcement that's within the concrete. And it, it'll last a long time. And we think it'll last up to 20 to 30 years. And so that's the main reason. And that's sort of the state of the art of rehabilitating you know, concrete surfaces. They, they use it quite a bit on, on bridges. And um, on bridges, it can last about 10 years, but because it's this bridge isn't um, subjected to like, like um, vehicles and that kind of thing, we think it can last even longer. So it, it has a lot of value in terms of the amount of money we're investing into this rehabilitation as well. So would it increase the lifetime of that surface so you wouldn't need to come out and repave it and replace it and have those impacts associated? That's yes, Great. that's another benefit thank of you. this, yes. And we can okay, um, we can we can color the 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 concrete to a more natural surface um, if if that's what's desired then we can we can match it with uh, the fencing and So you're touching on my uh, next question. One of the uh, things that they, in the public meeting that was done quite a while ago now, months, uh, the, public, the public asked about public art. And I went to look at our um, Baylands Conservation Plan, and it says, include appropriate environmental art in the Baylands that builds on Palo Alto's public art master plan, it says identify appropriate locations for additional public and uh, art installations and artist engagement. And then it says promote ecologically and educationally beneficial art to minimize uh, impacts and contribute and so on. So the bridge uh, fencing was identified by the public as a real opportunity to install art. And that has come up again and again, but um, at, until last time that I saw this, we still had these very, very tall black fences that are really not compatible with the Baylands. So I appreciate that you can offering to use potentially different colors for the uh, fence and potentially, uh, you know, more natural uh, surface for the for the bridge, but. I am still perplexed as to why there hasn't been any movement towards talking to our arts commission or somebody on our department who can look at this as an opportunity for art. I know the water district has an art uh, program where you actually sponsor or uh, provide grants for art and the city also has funding for art. So why are we still looking at a fence? That really perks something that I really have a hard time understanding. And in terms of the height of the fence, you know, I'm not a very large person. And right now I can still stand there and look over the fence. That's not going to be the case once this is installed. And so I wonder if, you ask, if, if it's a requirement or recommendation to make the fence higher. And the reason I'm asking that is because I cannot imagine any biker falling into the water from that bridge. It's just not likely. And it never happened and probably never will happen. So why do we need, do we absolutely have to have a taller uh, fence is one question. And the second one is, can we get art instead of a fence on that bridge? It's a perfect place for it. 
Um, okay. Yeah. Getting to the, to the first question, we, we have had uh, several discussions with city staff, uh, Sarah and Steve, as well as your um, staff that, that oversees the public art um, program. And um, I, I don't, my understanding is, is that it may or may not be required, but um, if it is a requirement, then we'll, we'll, we'll work with city staff to, to make that happen. So how does that become a requirement? <laughs> Well, per so so staff has met um, as Carl mentioned with, um, and we've reviewed the project, and it doesn't fit the guidelines to um, to be a requirement for public art. So it's not mandated that the project incorporates it. Um, however, we have discussed in terms of. Um, project timeline and incorporating art, it just likely wouldn't be able to happen concurrently. It would have to be at a different pace because of um, the design that has already been completed. Um, and then the public arts um, staff has mentioned the process wouldn't lend itself at to to have these two things happening concurrently. I'm sorry, that's kind of disappointing. But my next question on that would be, if you install the fence, and let's say you make it a nice color that the birds can see, but people are pretty comfortable with, and not black. Um, and then after, and then meanwhile, there's another process to select some kind of art that would be compatible with that location. How easy it is to replace the fence with the art? Is it even possible? Uh, sorry, I, I, I'd have to look into that I, um, with our, with our um, art folks, um, but I, I'm not really sure. I, I think we're getting outside of the, the purview of the commission in terms of imposing specific requirements related to public art and we're Parks and Recreation Commission. I want to focus on the sort of substance of what we're hearing tonight instead of I don't think it's addition. irrelevant. I'm sorry. It's in our uh, Baylands master plan. I, I think that there hasn't been significant public discussion and outreach on this topic because there also may be people of the opinion, including myself, that think that maybe the fence should be minimal, natural, and not have art. So without having that discussion and a public comment, I don't think that this has been noticed properly and that there's enough um, information for the public to, for us to make an informed decision tonight. Okay, we don't need to make a decision, but this was something that came up in the first public meeting at the Baylands from the public. Um, getting back to your second question about the fence size, that that is more of a recommendation. Um, we've we've done some research um, with regards to fence height and and safety for both bikers and pedestrians. And because there are a lot of bikers that are that are there, we we decided to go with the higher fence for for that purposes to provide safety for the bikers, which are higher up, as you know. Okay, um, I, I I don't know that I can go any further with that, but I find that um, you know the the Baylands need to have a real high aesthetic value. I don't know that anybody will ever jump over that fence, not intentionally, even with a bike. Yeah, I mean, we're, I don't think we're set in stone with that height. We could work with staff, whatever staff recommends and, and, and prefers. So. We, can, we can take a look at the height and see what the current restrictions are and what the recommendations for public safety are as well. Thank you. Other questions or comments, Vice Chair Freeman? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for a very uh, thorough presentation, um, and just kind of kind of going back to when you met with us a few months ago. It was um, um, there appears to be have been a lot of uh, track work done on it. So I definitely appreciate the, sort of like the, the in depth uh, project management uh, and, and thinking through a lot of the. The different things. One of the one of the uh, questions I have is how will so it sounds like uh, 2011 or like was it 2011 I guess when you kind of did an inspection and found that there was water leaking. Um, how often does since well how often was the inspection because it sounds like 
1957 is when this project was completed, I guess. And then 2011 is when you discovered kind of a issue. And I assume that there's been sort of ongoing inspections since that time. And have you seen sort of an, an erosion where it's getting worse over time? And it looks like, is there a clock ticking now that you really have to get phase one done before something happens that makes it even worse? Yeah, so the issue uh, you're talking about in, back in 20, 2011 was um, water seeping below the structure itself and, and, and seeping um, back into the into the flood basin. Um, we actually, we fixed that um, by, by um, um, basically clogging the, the leak that was going beneath the structure itself. Um, since then, we have been doing yearly inspections. Um, we, we go inspect the structure itself, um, as well as the, the, the steel sheet piles that are out there. So we do a full inspection of, of, of that structure. We have a, we have a structural consultant that provides that, um, to us, and lets us know, um, you know, if there's any imminent, um, repairs that need to be done. Um, but we also, um, every, every few years we have divers go out there too, and we do an underwater inspection. And so we do both, um. After, after this work is done, we will continue to do those things. Um, that'll be part of our routine maintenance and inspection that we'll, that we'll perform um, until the structure is, is going to be replaced. And how, and how will that, is that something that's um, using some type of tool to try and um, see whether or not there's any need for any repairs before they get sort of um, out of control? Is there, I mean, are, what, what, what type of inspection is done Ongoing will be done after the after the um, the project is completed after phase two, I guess it is. Um, they're they're mostly visual inspections okay. um, by by trained engineers that are um, looking for certain things um, with the structure itself. Um, the 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 divers um, when they're down there, um, they're they're looking they're looking for any kind of you know voids or any kind of. Um, in this particular case, it, ha it happened to be water was 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 gushing. Um, it was it was almost like a like like a toilet, <laughs> you know, so to speak. Water was gushing from one side to the other, and so that was more of a visual thing. Um, we knew that there was an issue. So, um, but they're looking for any kind of voids that are down there, um, any kind of um, uh, distress or, or, or so forth within the concrete itself b below the, uh, the water surface. Okay. And I guess my last question would be what, what, on, um, who will have the responsibilities for that ongoing maintenance? Is it the city? Is it the Valley Water District or? It's Valley Water. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Uh, and then I guess one last question here is how will the, uh, project address any potential flooding, emergencies during the interim period uh, before the completion of the tide gate structure. And it sounds like just starting in September and j complete in January. So possibility you won't have too much of uh, rain before that time. So. Um, so, so our role is really to, to make sure that those tide gates are working in the way they should be. Um, so, so it's, it's the maintenance that our, that our staff does, the important maintenance that they do, making sure that the trash rack is, is debris is removed so that it's not impeding the flow of water through those. And, and so we do that on a, on a yearly basis. Um, we're getting prepared to do um, our, our, our maintenance coming up in, in, I think it's end of October uh, fairly soon. And that's to make sure that those gates are working properly. They're, they're sealed um, so that the, the tide water can't come in. Um, and, and then making sure the trash racks are, are operating properly. So, but we also work with the city staff. Um, we're monitoring water levels within the flood basin. We're um, working with them to see if there's any debris out there that we need to go out there and remove debris. And so those are all um, critical things that we're, we're constantly in, in collaboration with the city staff. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cripp. Yes, thank you. First of all, thank you for the very thorough report. Appreciate it. Um, I just have questions about the communication. So November the 20th, is that uh, the public meeting in by Zoom? Is it in person? It will be in, in, in person. Uh -huh. um, we we all, we'll also have, we, we usually have some kind of a virtual um, option for people that want to um, just 
from their home come in. And so where, in. where will that be? Um, I think we're planning to have it at Mitchell, Mitchell Park over in the library over there. Oh, good. So good. I believe what it is. But we'll, we'll be putting out um, our own sort of um, outreach um, with mailers, next door, um, those kinds of things. We'll also work we'll, we'll, with our city counterparts to have that um, published on, on the city website. So um, we'll do a variety of things. For, that was for my next question. <laughs> we, <laughs> Will we, you and the city work together? And yes. We've been you. collaborating on this for a while now. Great. Um, and then finally, um, the projection is for the project to be finished in um, the 2026? Janu January of 2026 is when we're... So are you pretty confident about it being done at that time? At this point, yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Assuming we don't have any issues with our permits or or, or that sort of thing, mm -hmm. um, that's that's usually some of the some of the challenges that we have with scheduling. Um, and then and then, but but as long as we can get our contractor out there um, in a timely manner, then I think we're looking good. We're 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 sort of sequencing the works so that we get the most challenging a lot of the earthwork done up front before the. Um, before the rainy period starts, which is October fifteenth time frame, and so we're looking to have the um, the the deep foundation system put in first between September and October fifteenth. That way, um, that'll be done before the, any of the rain, rainy season um, hits us, and when when we have all the ground disturbing activities, which can be very difficult in the, in the rain. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Um, most every question was answered either verbally through you or a little fo footnote on the slide. So I appreciate you anticipating uh, questions that we would ask. Um, just want to reiterate that this is an action item. So we will be voting on this uh, tonight and say that at the beginning of the item. So my apologies. Um, I appreciate and my interest is really um, from a safety and resiliency standpoint that this really does last till 2060 or if some miraculous funding um, drops from the sky sooner than that, um, that would be lovely. Uh, but to make sure that it is safe for not only the people that are visiting that area, but the maintenance workers that are out there doing the regular work in rainy conditions. And that can affect anything from hiring these folks, making sure that they have good working conditions to Le potential legal liability. So looking at it from that lens as well, um, I think is very important for this for this body. Um, and that comes anything to the fence height, you never know with human error or rainy conditions when they're gonna be out there. Um, so I would defer to um, staff's recommendations on fence height and color and whatever staff recommends. And are you looking for answers for those things or input from us tonight? Or cause that's something that could be fed through staff um, following this action item. It can be fed through staff over the next several months. Um, you know, we're, we're looking to finish up with our design documents, which we call bid documents. Mm -hmm. It's something that we um, um, present to, to potential bidders. And that's where we want to know uh, what colors you prefer and, and, and fence height and that kind of thing. Sure. I imagine some of the commissioners that are not here may have some thoughts as well that they would like to share, um, both on height and color. Um, and then on the uh, the trail trail closure impacts, I appreciate you sort of being conservative with that, the sort of under promise over deliver. I think that's good for the community messaging. So I agree with that strategy. Um, on the addendum to the MND, were there significant comments that came from that or that you guys got any feedback? Um, you mean like through a public scoping? Yeah. Um, so the, the addendum is... Um, doesn't go through a public scoping okay. period like 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 an like an MND document mm -hmm. would, um, because it's it's um, in this particular case the um, the scope is so much uh, less than than what the original project was, mm -hmm. and so though um, I, I don't believe that the the impacts were at a level that would require like a public scoping kind of thing. Okay, great, that's helpful. Um, and then this is a question I think for city staff that um, Commissioner Greenfield sent. Um, regarding the non-passive gate, because I don't know how to pronounce the sluice. So, oh, the sluice gate. Sluice gate. Uh -huh. uh, I know it's not necessarily related to this item, but he just did want to um, have an update in the record for this for this meeting. Sure, where we are with the sluice gate, basically we've been reaching out to different contractors and uh, seeing what we could do to do a maintenance work on that to get it operational. 
Um, just to be transparent, it hasn't been operational for the last four years. Um, so uh, what we've been doing, we've reached out to them. We're going to be working with our local regulatory agencies and uh, determining if permitting is required prior to that and potentially working with uh, Valley Water as well, maybe in October, get them on board, uh, get the gate cleaned off and functional again. So that's the plan for now. Great. I think it's very helpful. You're welcome. Are there any other comments? Yeah, Councilman Rinker. Yeah, thank you. I don't uh, intend to make any comments, but I do have a couple quick questions since this is a uh, staff recommendation that uh, the council adopt uh, an ordinance ultimately. Um, what in terms of the timing? I looked at the slide that talked about the project timing and when would you anticipate, like after what and before what, when would it come to council? Um, I believe we're targeting the October 15th um, city council meeting. Would, would it be I, possible? I actually, I think we have it coming in November to, which is after their board is so in order for council to act on it. Um, we, the CEQA has to be completed, which has to be approved by their board. And in order to get it timing through the workflow, we have it, I believe, um, kind of slated for a November date. Okay, so after the obtain environmental permit, after the public meeting update? Yes. Okay, so probably after Thanksgiving. <laughs> so yeah, you bring up a good point. Maybe it's more like looking like December. Okay, I just wanted to, you know, the, uh, Commissioner Cribs was asking about the uh, completion date and we're all wanting to stay on track. And so I was just curious when it was going to come to council as part of that. Okay, thank you. And then my other question um, is that, um, is a question about how, if at all, does this dovetail with uh, BCDC's upcoming guidance uh, in its regional shoreline adaptation plan? because that's going to include guidelines and standards for local governments to follow as we create these sub-regional shoreline adaptation plans. And I think, you know, they are working on that as we speak. And I'm just wondering whether that would be part of what would be presented to council or seems to me at least phase two is probably gonna to have to coordinate with that. So does that impact phase one and is that gonna be part of what's presented to us? Thank you, Susan. All right. Um, Council Member Renke, being here, um, Bhavani Airport, the Deputy Operating Officer for uh, Valley Water. Um, so right now, where we stand is the shoreline protection study that uh, was ongoing with the city of Palo Alto. Uh, and for this region, uh, concluded last year with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, kind of backing off from that study, essentially saying that the amount of damages um, that was envisioned for this area does not meet their criteria for funding a project. So they uh, they concluded their study with that, uh, but but we are continuing to coordinate with the city of Palo Alto, uh, public works department, and to uh, or any other regional efforts. Essentially, the Army Corps study finding was that the amount of damages and a federal interest for funding a project is probably not until 2060. Uh, absent that, the regional efforts, I know City of San Jose, uh, City of Palo Alto and Caltrans and others are part of that collaborative effort. Um, at this point, staff is, uh, at least Valley Water staff is simply monitoring those efforts, but we do anticipate picking that back up at a later date because the Army Corps study kind of said, doesn't look like the amount of damages are significant enough until much further down. Uh, a decade or uh, or more later. So that future project is not yet in any of our 20 year work plans. And when you say the future project, you mean phase two? Has yes. It's been described yes. here? Yes. Okay, but does the, uh, the guidelines that I understand are gonna be coming out shortly for cities uh, going to affect any of the phase one work from BCDC? When they come out, we'll have to evaluate. There is broader shoreline efforts that is a part that is already in construction in the San Jose El Viso area. There's another study that we are actively working with the Army Corps in the Sunnyvale area. Um, but the middle portion of the study with the Army Corps 
has concluded. So when the new guidelines come, uh, definitely Valley Water staff, along with the city of Palo Alto staff, will take a look at that and see if anything needs to be revisited in that time. Okay. I was just trying to figure out how all of it dovetails together because there's a lot of moving pieces here. And if we're all trying to move quickly, uh, right. that's it, a big piece. So Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, there are two active projects on either side of this that are uh, of this piece of the shoreline uh, that, that we're actively working on. And as, as new sea level rise guidance comes up, uh, we always take a look at uh, reevaluating our projects uh, from, from those uh, lens as well. So Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Hearing none, um, is there a motion from any of the commissioners with regards to this item? I'll try. I would say to recommend the city council to approve the project with additional considerations of the heights and colors uh, that are used in this project and the potential to work uh, to introduce art as well. Is that, is that all you need? Yep, unless you want to speak to your motion anymore. Okay. I think I've done plenty. No, okay. Is there a second to that motion? And staff, is that what you would need for, for is that? substantial to bring forward but that is yes okay great with approval of the park improvement ordinance okay. we need that to be a part of of the motion today okay please add that okay great i will second shawnee's motion commissioner kindness motion and can we do a vote <clears throat> Commissioner Cribbs. Sorry, yes. Commissioner Kleinhaus. Yes. Vice Chair Freeman. Yes. And Chair Brown. Yes. That is a 4 0 vote. Thank you, and thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much. All right, next item of business is the first T update. All right, thank you. Um, with that, uh, next I'd like to introduce um, Lon Doe, who is our uh, golf or super uh, superintendent of open space parks and golf and uh, George Moxie, who is the uh, president and CEO of the first T Silicon Valley. Well, I'm take it away. Thank you, Chair Brown and fellow members of the commission uh, for this opportunity to present uh, this evening information on a, our collaboration between the city and the first T of Silicon Valley. I am Lam Doe with the Division of Open Space, Parks and Golf. And this evening we are joined by George Moxie, CEO of First Tee Silicon Valley. Um, next slide. Some background information here. Beginning in 2009 to the present time, we've had an active uh, collaboration between the city and the First Tee, um, starting out with uh, their predecessor organizations, the San Jose Sports Authority, through an Eagles program, and then later on the First Tee San Jose, and now uh, the current um, success organization, which is First Tee Silicon Valley, headed by George here. Um, the program is a youth development program uh, teaching life skills and core values through golf. Uh, these values uh, encompass honesty, integrity, sportsmanship, respect, collaboration, confidence, responsibility, and um, the program has uh, been a part of the, the fabric of the golf course for the past 15 years. 
there's been a brief time where um, through due to COVID and, and some restrictions during COVID that we were, we were not able to uh, collaborate directly, but we still continued our relationship throughout that time. Um, currently, the uh, program allows uh, about 300 participants to um, a year at the Baylands Golf Links. Um, this is at capacity and there are wait lists as well. Um, we have a good mix. The program provides uh, about 40% uh, girls and about 59% um, boys uh, with, in grades two through 12. Um, the majority of the participants are grades two through eight. Um, and hopefully you know, we can also exp uh, include uh, more of the older grades as well. Um, there's about 31% uh, Palo Alto participants and then we have participants in East Palo Alto, Redwood City as well, and uh, throughout the region. Um, the re uh, first sea Silicon Valley actually covers um, as far south as um, uh, San Benito County, parts of that, um, and as far north as uh, San Mateo County, where uh, San Mateo and Highway 92 reach. Um, they encompass it into all of Santa Clara County itself. Um, in addition to that, the First East Silicon Valley also has um, uh, supplements their uh, on-course program with a, an, uh, an outreach program to um, eight local regional schools here. And where they, have, they are able to um, have uh, 1,600 participants in the outreach program. Next slide, please. Next, I'd like to talk about um, the, uh, the, our partnership efforts and the benefits of the, that uh, we've seen from that. Um, this allows us to focus on youth programming. Um, there is a delivery of on-site youth community services, um, uh, and we encompass the wide range. Um, so these are things, uh, efforts that perhaps in the community service department, our bandwidth isn't there to uh, fulfill. So um, th having a partnership really helps us um, that we can reach both not just Palo Alto youth, but also regional participants as well. Um, this is inclusive of underserved communities uh, in particular, the First East Silicon Valley offers uh, financial aid uh, to offset the uh, participation costs. And this is uh, through their efforts uh, as well. Um, the, the collaboration allows both parties to pair and leverage our core competency, competencies and our facilities. Um, the youth uh, programs are able to use a silly facility while the program of delivery through the first tee of Silicon Valley, and as mentioned before, um, their bandwidth is much, is much larger than the bandwidth of uh, our programs uh, that we directly deliver services to. So it's a good pairing for both, for both as well. Um, it also allows us to have a utilization of a, a youth practice area that is currently at the golf course. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's um, uh, pub, uh, outreach to local schools another um, benefit of, of this partnership as well. Um, through our continued partnership, um, you know, the youth development continues on. There's also a benefit to the golf industry as a whole, uh, where we're able to establish our future customer base in the golf industry, um, where they're able to enjoy the, all the benefits of the sport of golf as well. So, uh, with that, let me turn this over to George here. George, if you want to push this right button. Um, and George rules. Um, speak about their youth program uh, specifics and also their outreach programs as well. Great, thanks, Lam. Next slide, please. So our schedule is four seasons a year, eight weeks at a time. Uh, and then we're there at uh, here at Baylands uh, Tuesday through Friday. We're not at Baylands on Saturdays at present. And those classes are after school, 4.30 to 6.00. And then winter time, because of daylight savings, uh, it's an hour earlier, 3.30 to 5. Uh, we're using the range and the putting green uh, areas. So currently using four bays. Uh, in the winter time, we're not going to uh, have course access. So the number of bays increases from four to eight. And that's the reason for no course access in the winter time is getting little legs out there and on and off the golf course is not easy when it's dark. Um, and then we're currently using a third of the large putting green. There's a smaller putting green. If we're not using that, we're using um, a portion of the, or the, we're using the small putting green. And Lum mentioned the youth area. There is a little portion of the youth area that can be used uh, presently. Uh, and we may be in there. So we're kind of moving around just a little bit um, uh, based on 
operator uh, needs there at the golf course. And I mentioned uh, golf course were there or the actual course, Tuesday through Friday tee times. What we do is four tee times with a buffer tee time before and after. Uh, and then we're only using holes one through four. So we're off the course within about an hour, an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Next slide, please. So that was for the, what we're calling the interim use agreement. And it's basically what we're doing right now. Um, so what we think is that we can expand to from 300 that Long, met, Long mentioned to 800 kids and teens a year. Um, and then on the outreach side, it would be about 5,000 kids, uh, students and schools. <clears throat> and then uh, generally speaking, children are taking uh, two classes per year. So we would see that with the 800 Tuesday through Friday, um, but we think that we can, add, we have a way to add Saturday classes. So Saturday classes um, would over more than double uh, the footprint that we have. Um, our program is currently 85% eth ethnically uh, diverse. And then about 50% uh, of our kids, ultimately we wanna have as low income. It's around 32%. Uh, right now. Uh, Lum mentioned the fees and financial aid. Um, standard price of a class is $240. Uh, kids can pay or families can pay as little as 20 bucks. Um, there are some cases where we don't charge at all um, because it's such a hardship for the families. Next slide, please. So we need to do a little bit of work if we are gonna expand because the golf course is so highly utilized. Um, especially on Saturdays, we are, have been looking at the youth area, which is the area between the range and Embarcadero Road. It's already an irrigated uh, and fenced off area, um, but it needs protection, <clears throat> excuse me, from range balls. And then cars and the street need protection from the youth area. So mm -hmm. what we're proposing and have been talking about is completing that youth area with safety nets so that we can hold a, a good portion of our programming, most of our programming, frankly, in that area. And then uh, continue to use the driving range between four to eight uh, stalls. And it just really depends on what we, uh, what we can negotiate and what makes sense with the city. Uh, still use uh, a portion of the putting green because the small putting green is adjacent uh, to where we're using the range stalls and the youth area, the smallest putting green or the small putting green would be ideal. And then really have the exact same footprint on the course, 430 to 520 tee times, Tuesday through Friday. Um, overall, when you look at this, we're talking about 70% of our programming being in the youth area, 10% being in these other areas each, whether it's the range, the small putting green and the golf course. And when you look at our overall footprint right now, and or actually what we're proposing here, it's only about 11% of daylight hours across the year. So it's not a huge footprint. Okay, Bob? Thank you, George. Next slide, please. Now I want to speak on our next steps to sort of further collaboration and where, where we tend to head after this. Thank you, Lam. So with that, we're looking at, uh, you know, very shortly implementing the short term use agreement like we've been working on for some time now, uh, developing a multi year agreement for longer term use, uh, which is something that I think that uh, has been in, you know, kind of the plan for some time, uh, continue to strategize and develop the program that works for both the city of Palo Alto and for the first tee of Silicon Valley. Um, they'll also, you know, continue with their outreach efforts. Uh, to see what they can do to maximize their programming for the youth and evaluate opportunities for the practice area improvements, as George explained uh, just a little bit ago. Next slide. And with that, that concludes our presentation. Thank you. Um, before we bring it to the commission, is there any public comment on this item? No hands raised online or in person. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, any questions or comments from the commission? This is a discussion item only, so no formal action from the commission. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much. 
um, again, it's really great to see um, the list of what you're planning to do. I'm really glad to see this again. I feel like we've had this discussion for quite some time and I know that everybody's been busy, but I think on all sides, there's a lot of frustration about um, hearing about the first tee because it's such a great national program. And we're really lucky in Palo Alto to have the opportunity to be part of this and to have our kids be part of it. Um, I think it's a very um, sensible, very uplifting way to introduce kids to sports and I would really love to see some um, dates on that list that the last list you showed about what you're going to do next and see when when this can be done um, so that the first tee can make their announcements and raise the money that they want to raise and have agreements that will be permanent for our kids. So what I was thinking about when I was thinking about this today is that um, when we started this, the kids who had the opportunity to participate were six. And now they're probably 10 and I want them to be 11 before, I, so we can offer this program. So thank you very much for all the work on this, for your patience and um, full disclosure. I was part of the first tease birth in Santa Clara with the San Jose Sports Authority way before um, George was involved. And we were very proud of the program and we're very proud to see it extend to Palo Alto. So I'm a huge supporter. I don't think you can tell that. So anyhow, thank you again. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. And I um, side with uh, Chair Cribs on that one. We as having been part of the uh, last line for this and something we've been trying to, you know, work on for at least my 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 tenure here on the on the uh, uh, commission. So hopefully uh, we can move forward and lock up some dates. Um, I think like the Commissioner Cribs is saying, we, we want to make sure that uh, the kids who are here now don't outgrow and become adults and <laughs> miss out on the program. So um, we're hoping that uh, with the current status, of, I'd like to know what the current status of the, uh, the uh, regarding the public uh, partnership between the city and uh, the first tee and the, the timeline and, and sort of what is the, um, what do you, what do you look at it as being the hold up on that? I think we don't have it. No, go ahead. Um, you know, with um, the um, Steve coming on board and his experience, uh, having uh, worked and managed with golf courses and also worked with similar organizations such as the First Tee, um, I think George, uh, Steve, and I are, are excited to uh, take a uh, look at this and um, work towards what uh, we want this program to look in, like in the future. Um, it may or may not look like how it's originally proposed. Uh, so I think uh, there's things that we have to work out. Um, and I we, you know, we, right now, I think we are in agreement that we, we don't have a, a definite timeline right now, we, we, other than to say that we, um, all three of us are eager to uh, continue to look at this um, uh, and further this partnership. So when do you, well, I guess, when do you anticipate the negotiation process? And, you know, when, I mean, is, are we looking at months? Are we looking at years or... We're, we're looking at months for that one. Yeah. Uh, we've really stepped up, you know, basically meeting with each other, getting to know, you know, what each other, you know, the, the how it works uh, on a uh, collaboration, uh, what the first tee of Silicon Valley would like to see here. Uh, and just understanding how that's going to work for both the city of Palo Alto and with the first tee. Uh, so we're definitely stepping it up. We've increased our meetings. Um, and we have a very good, you know, collaboration at this point. And I just see this moving forward. Um, you know, within the next, you know, I don't want to say a definite time period, of, but we're looking at months instead of years, in other words. But I feel very good about the relationship that we've developed so far, and I can see this moving forward. Okay. George, do you want to say anything on that? Well, we're very close on the interim agreement. On the short-term <laughs> agreement, I, I think we're maybe within weeks, right? Yes. Um, so that that's really nice to have that you know, be real clear on what our current use is and what it'll be for the next few years. Um, and I think I completely agree with Steve. We're off to a good start. 
um, and our working relationship with Steve. And we have a lot of history with LOM, so we're prepared. We're ready for it. One of the things I love about um, Steve as uh, a new addition to the team is he's very familiar with Harding Park and what First East San Francisco has done in Harding Park. He has a definite idea of what's possible. That's a much larger scale project that they're doing, their youth facility at Harding. Um, <clears throat> so I feel very optimistic that we can move forward. Thank you. And um, I mean, it's a great program. So we, we, we're hoping that it just uh, takes off and exceed all of our expectations. So thanks for your great. continued patience on that and um, the work that the work with the city on this. Right. Thank you. We're already uh, kind of sold out for this fall. <laughs> um, the registration opened last week and it's already booked. So we're excited. Thank you. So um, can we ask if um, every month that we have a meeting that in the department report, we have a progress report about where we are um, with this is, I mean, is that, is that too much I'm sort of thinking that the interim agreement, if it's ready to go and be signed, should, should, we can report out on it. That sure. would be great. Um, that would be really wonderful to know. And then the second thing is there's been some discussion around about um, a second, um, a second story on the um, driving range is there any information about additional information about that right now? So I think there's a, there's a, a draft out on that right now and the recommendations that have been made. So it's currently being under review and um, we'll have more information on that to come as well. Thank you. You're Thanks. welcome. Commissioner Kleinhaus. No? <laughs> uh, great presentation. I do have a question more out of curiosity rather than questioning anything, uh, the the wait list numbers and then the capacity going from 300 to 800. Can you just talk through the whether the program design changes that you're talking about for the longer term agreement were to get to that number of 800 based on demand and capacity, or was it based on what you think the facility would be able to handle and 800 is the number that you you get to by making these enhancements to the program. Just a little bit about more of the process. Sure, so in terms of capacity, right now the capacity is 128. So it's four days, 32 kids each time, classes of 16, that's our limit. Um, what we've done is we've looked at the youth area because demand has been so high, our assumption is that we can grow substantially. I mean, the program in San Jose is well over 800 kids a year. It's a much larger, it's Tuesday through Friday. It's almost all day on Saturdays in East San Jose. So we think we can do something equivalent. Uh, but when we look at the, the layout of the facility in that youth area, that's part of what's helping us reach the, those capacity numbers. And then we're just sim simply multiplying it out, uh, knowing that it's a little bit restricted in the winter time. Um, I think our original estimates were over a thousand. So we've actually pulled it back a little bit in part too, because of the high utilization of the golf course, but it's, it's kind of looking at the facility and coming up with the numbers, knowing that the, that the demand has always been high. That's helpful. I just didn't know if there was sort of a magic number goal that we're trying to get to, although I'm sure that keeps going up as the program continues yeah, well, and, each and, day. And one of the goals is that 50% low income mm -hmm. and the diversity of the program. And um, we can really ramp up the school program. So we've literally held back what we can do on the school side and the outreach side, because there's nowhere for the kids to go. Um, and then what I think is gonna hap will happen with that youth area being accessible in Saturday programs, we'll see low income participation go up just because of the transportation constraints Tuesday through Friday for those families. I think we'll also see teen participation, high school participation go up because a lot of those kids have other activities in high school and they'll prefer Saturdays. So it's gonna be interesting to see how it would unfold. Thank you. Um, and then Lom spoke to the 
benefit of having sort of the supplement to staff that would not necessarily be able to administer this type of program and the flexibility and capacity uh, that comes along with that, especially the specific expertise in this area. So anything that we can do to help meet that flexibility and capacity, um, we are we are happy to do as a commission. If I, if I can mm -hmm. comment Please. on that, actually, you know, we view ourselves in this life skill through golf lane, if you will not golf instruction. So that's one of the nice things about our program. We're not competing with the operator's staff. We want them to have private instruction going and actually be really robust. Um, we want our kids who are really, really into golf and really excelling to take private lessons from the golf course. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship. We don't view it as competitive. That's great. I had one more question Let's about that. Thank you. Um, how does the first tee in general reach out to kids who might not normally think that they could play golf or want to play golf? Um, sure. how, do, how do you do that? Outreach is the big piece. It's the school program. So the goal with the school program, which it's much larger for us in East San Jose, around Rancho del Pueblo Golf Course, it's Title I schools. So we're, we literally are going to them and then we're trying to get them interested in the game, interested in the program with a lot of efforts with tabling at, at you know, at checkout after school, um, coffees with parents, um, back to school night, all kinds of different things. We need to reach the parents. Um, in our program uh, or in our partnership with PAL, Redwood City, um, they're bringing some kids to the golf course for the program. We require the parents to have the relationship with us, not the entity. The entity is helping us get the kids there to and from on Fridays in particular, but we want the relationship with the parents. So it's outreach ultimately to get to the parents because they're the decision makers and a, a large part of the um, community that we're trying to reach is the Latino community and it's moms most definitely moms who are making the decisions uh, to have the kids participate. So we do a lot in Spanish translation. All our materials are in Spanish, English and Spanish. Thank you. Councilmember Vinker, any comments? All right, seeing none, thank you very much for the wonderful Great, presentation and update. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, George. All right, we will move on to last business item, ad hoc committees and liaison updates. Commissioner Kleinhaus. So um, we're just starting in a lot of our meetings with stuff and working on materials. So the, the only one I can update on today is the BCCP. Uh, we met with staff. Uh, we're going to have the ad hoc uh, start with helping update the um, existing condition report, which is no, no longer <laughs> existing condition since it was done last time. So that's our first step and we're working on that. And we did have a meeting on the master plan ad hoc. <laughs> It's, it's ours. <laughs> it's poor. Um, so we just sort of um, did a touch base with staff and got them oriented to where we came from last year and where, where we're going this year. Um, and then we will be doing a meeting on dog parks um, just to, we will. We will. Yes. Yeah, so we, next month we will have more to report on, um, but just sort of doing a check-in on some projects and some following up on some community feedback that we've received. Anything else on that? Mm, not no. in dog parks. I yeah. think that's good. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, aquatics is beginning the fall schedule. Um, everything's going well, according to um, Tim Sheeper. So that's great as usual. And I think he's continues to look for more opportunities for instructors for adults and um, swimming lessons, which is um, pretty important continues to be um, good news with the skating community. Um, thanks to Sarah bringing people together and um, having several discussions with the Skaters Collective. Um, they have 
initiated a press release, which we will see probably almost maybe tomorrow or the next day, or maybe right after Labor Day, about their goal to raise a million and a half dollars. Um, there's an opportunity to um, contribute through the Friends of the Palo Alto Park. So on the Friends website, there is a bucket for contributions. And um, the skaters and the designer have worked with Peter Jensen and worked with Sarah. Um, there is a good description of what they intend to do. And um, I'm pretty excited about it. So again, this is one of those things that they have, Sam started when he was a sophomore and he just went back to his sophomore year in Boulder. And I think that the skate park will um, prove to be a really great addition to the city's historic skate park. So thanks Sarah for your work on that. And we'll all see the press release very soon. And I would say that Megan, the city's communications person was very helpful um, in guiding some of the language in the release. So that's all, that's all good. On the Wellness Recreation Center, we have now some lovely quotes from the city of Palo Alto, from um, Kristen O'Kane and also from Mayor Stone about um, the importance of the Wellness Center. Um, there is still discussion. Well, let me go back to that. Um, so there's a, a deck being produced um, by the friends that will talk about um, the potential for fundraising. And um, that'll be available in the next month or so. In the meantime, I think both Nellis and I on the ad hoc committee are waiting very patiently for the Cubberly decision about um, the land and um, the acquisition and what's going to happen next and how it's going to happen. And we're also looking, continue to look at listening and looking at Greer as a possibility. So Nellis, do you anything to add to that particular piece? No, I think you've covered everything. I, I, it's, um, I mean, it's nice to know that we've, the skate park thing just sort of, you know, was dormant for a while and then it just uh, mushroomed into something big again. So and I think also with the, um, you know, skating being very popular at the Olympics, but even before that, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a lot of interest in it. And I think that's going to be kind of one of those things that's going to be a shining star for the city. So hopefully we get that moving, keep that moving in the right gear. So really looking forward to the uh, press release on that. So there'll be a break dancing room in the center, the wellness center from the Olympics. <laughs> Um, once we have the release, um, Sam is going to send it out from, from the Skaters Collective. Great. But if I can send it to you, then you could send it to the commissioners. That would be great. Thank you. Any other updates? Commissioner, Vice uh, Yeah, I'm, I, well, I'm golf liaison, so we, we just heard about that one. So we're good on that one. Um, as far as the um, nature uh, preserve access policy, just, did get some inputs. We're sort of still in a um, state of trying to figure out what's, where we go from there. But just some of the things that have taken place is that the staff has installed all the uh, signage um, indicated on the map, except for uh, two signs uh, at the Friendship Bridge, I guess it is. And then uh, currently coordinating with uh, East Palo Alto to confirm the, um, the sewer line location before completing the um, installation of those particular signs. I don't know if there's any progress on that yet, but it's, it's nice to know that we've actually had some some uh, movement on that. Um, and then for the e-bike signs, there are a total of 14 not permitted signs and 11 permitted signs placed throughout the, um, the Baylands. Um, additionally, where, um, where space allows, staff has also installed tra uh, trail courtesy uh, triangle signs. So there's been a lot of signs. I haven't been out there recently, but I'm assuming a lot of, I don't know if you're getting any comments on the signage. Do you know? Um, currently no feedback. Okay. Uh, and then bike racks have been purchased. Rangers, uh, Ranger staff met with one contractor last week and have scheduled another contractor on August 28th to obtain additional bids for installation. Do you have to know what the timeline of that might be? Yeah, we should be able to report out on this next month and supply the ad hoc with more information as things progress. Okay. 
And that's about it for that. Any other comments or follow up questions? Your fault. Do, do we have something on the um, the courts to report? No. Pickleball. No, not so much pickleball, yeah. but just tennis, tennis and pickleball. Oh, maybe we can wait no, till we, next. we didn't have anything. We did meet with Adam on that, but we didn't have any. Uh, yeah, we some, did. Um, they are doing some additional analysis. And so hopefully at our next meeting, we'll be able to maybe dig into a little bit. Uh, part of that is to find out has the surveying of how well that's working with uh, the pickleball community as well as the tennis community. So hopefully we'll have more on that next time. Great. Um, moving on to questions, comments, announcements, and future agenda items. Steve, do you want to speak to the uh, next month's agenda tentatively? Sure. On, um, for next month, we are looking at being uh, being an informational presentation from the Baylands. And then um, also, Sarah, I think we were talking about uh, having a presentation for the youth. Yeah, Youth Council. Mm -hmm. uh, typically, that's been heard in October, but um, they are open to coming next month if if you'd like them. So those are the two uh, items that we are potentially going to put on next uh, month's agenda. What about the work plan? The work plan is going to council. I now believe it's, it's October, October 5th. October. Yeah. So let me, I can check. Yes. So we are seventh? Yeah. I have seventh. October seventh. Yeah. Right in the middle. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna be there. I'm not okay. gonna be there on October fifth. It's a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We won't be there either. <laughs> the seventh. Um, so we will be, um, Vice Chair and I will be there to speak to the work plan. But in the interim, I think the guidance has been to sort of continue moving mm -hmm. on what we have. And um, that's the direction we've received so far. Um, any questions on next month's agenda or specific items? The Baylands, I understand the scope is going to be kind of similar to the Foothills update and sort of, sort of a broad. Right. Yeah, we'll have a PowerPoint presentation for everybody to take a look at. Great. With lots of nature facts. Yay. <laughs> we'll definitely have nature on yeah. that one. <laughs> it's coming. All right. Any other comments or questions? Announcements? Wonderful. Let's adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.